Welcome back guys, it's Israel. So you have a database and you wanna get your brand new .NET API communicating with that database as quickly as possible? Well, you might wanna go with the database first approach using Entity Framework. So let's talk about what that is and how you can do it. Let's go. But first, I just wanna give a shout out to all my channel members. If you wanna see your name here as well as get access to all the code from all my videos, click the link in the description or the join button on my profile and send an email to this email with the code you want access to. But now, onto the video. So I brought up the database first approach. What is it? Let's dive into it. So the database first approach just really means that you start with a database that already exists or was just created. And then from that database scheme, you generate the classes and DB context within your application using Entity Framework. So I'll show you guys when we get to the application, the NuGet packages that you need for Entity Framework so that that works. This is obviously a better approach if you have a legacy system that you're migrating. So you have a brand new application and maybe a large older database. So you don't really wanna go through the hassle of having to map everything over. You just want to quickly scaffold your schema using Entity Framework and get the whole picture of what the database looks like into your application. But now let's actually see how that works. All right, so I've gone ahead and created a brand new .NET 9 API. I deleted all that weather forecast stuff. So now we just have an empty controllers folder, a program, and we have nothing here. So to actually get Entity Framework in here, we need to get some NuGet packages. So let's go download the ones that we need. The first one that we're gonna need is Entity Framework Core. So look it up. And we need to install this one. So install this one and I'll be right back once it's done. The next one that we're gonna need is actually right here. So it's Entity Framework Core dot design. So install that one as well. The next one is gonna be depending on what database type you're gonna be using. So I'm gonna be doing SQL Server, but if you're doing Postgres or something else, you need to get the appropriate package for that. But in my case, I'm doing SQL Server. So I need to download that one. And then finally, the last one is gonna be Entity Framework dot tools and install that one. And we're done with the NuGet packages. So now that we have our NuGet packages for Entity Framework ready, well, obviously we're doing database first. So what's the database that we're even kind of mapping over? So with the one we're actually using is this sample database that I've used in previous videos. Uh, so we have three tables. It's a Pokemon table, a region table, and type. So if you've never played Pokemon, Pokemon uh, can be from different regions and they can have different types. So if we select, and let me just show you guys what's in here. So we should have some of my favorite Pokemon in this database once they load. Uh, as you can see, we have six. We have Metagross, Tyranitar, Halucha, Charizard, Scrafty, and Electivire. They have a type ID, a Pokedex number, and a region ID that then maps to this table. That's a region and then they're given type. So we're just doing one simple type. And this is the database that we are actually gonna scaffold over using Entity Framework. So this is the database. Just wanted you guys to know that we have these three tables and kind of what it looks inside of it. But now let's continue with our application. So now that we have our NuGet packages, the next thing that we need to do is we need to go to our app settings and we need to add in our connection string. So this is gonna be the connection string to our local sample database. So sample database, the server is my local. So if you go here, you see that it is our sample database. So we just need the connection string to this. And now we are ready to actually scaffold in our tables from that database into a models folder. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna right click on our project DB first, we're gonna open in terminal, and then we're gonna run the following command. So the command is gonna be as follows. So it's gonna be .NET EF DB context scaffold, and then it's gonna be in quotations, name equals connection strings, colon default connection. So this right here is gonna to map to your app settings right here. So connection strings default connection. That's what's going on in here. So you don't actually have to put the whole connection string into your command. Then you're gonna do Microsoft.NADFramework.SQL server, which is the package we just installed. Then you're gonna do dash O models. This is basically directing the output folder. So even if you don't have the folder created, it will create the folder and then put all the models in that given folder. And we're just naming it models. Then you have dash dash force. So in here, you're basically forcing an overwrite. So let's say in the future, I update a column in my database and I wanna re-scaffold. Well, if I say the output is models, it will try and overwrite. And if I don't do dash dash force, it will be like, hey, there's already something there. We can't overwrite. But if you dash dash force, it will overwrite whatever models you had in there. And it's a quick way to just refresh all your models without having to manually go in there and change it. But now the only other thing I wanna say is if you get some type of error here with maybe one of the NuGet packages not being recognized, either close VS Studio and then bring it back up again. Or what you can do is just, um, you can do just a build of your solution and sometimes that'll fix some of the weird uh, Visual Studio errors that kind of happen. But now let's press enter and see if this works. But right before we do that, if you found this video helpful, please drop a like on this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss any of the other amazing content that I have for you guys. And we can see that the build has started, build succeeded. And now 
it's finished. So now if we go over here, we see that we have this models folder right here. We can see that we have the Pokemon table with its connections to region and type. We can see that we also have the region. Uh, a region would have a list of Pokemon as well as a, po a type would have a list of Pokemon as well. Then we have our sample database context. All of this was generated. So that's really cool. And now we have all of our models. And now all we would need to do is add our DB context on startup. So the last thing we need to do is in our program.cs, just paste this in right here, which is basically it's adding the DB context we just scaffolded in. So this one, and we are now connecting to that SQL database using the default connection string. That's this one right here. And we should be connecting to the database and we have all the models needed for our given controllers to be able to have all the information needed. The other quick thing that I just want to point out once you scaffold your DB context is it may come with something like this. And this overriding is the exact same thing as when you set it up using this. So you can just get rid of this from your context because you don't need it and you're good. Okay, so you have your models and your DB context, but let's just say you're like, hmm, well actually at my job, I don't really have access to my SQL Server Manager to manually add in a new column down the line. So how do I go about changing the database or adding columns to tables down the line if I need them? If all I have is the database first approach, right? You're, you kind of feel like you're helpless and there's nothing you could do other than send an email to someone to add that column in and maybe they ignore you. So how can you do this? Well, we can switch to the code first approach. So you can start with DB first and go to code first and you're gonna have to do it in this way. So let's say what we wanted to do was add in this column for color. Well, we'd have an issue right now because if some of you know, the code first approach uses migrations. So let's say we wanted to do this .NET EF migrations add color. So we could press enter here and we're going to run into an issue once this creates everything. So this is done. So we have a migrations here in this migrations folder is a snapshot of the current database as well as the change we want to make. But with this, we're going to run into an issue one. If we tried to create this right now, we already have this database. We have these tables. All of this is there. And this color is what we want to add, but we're trying to create stuff that already exists. So this is going to be a problem. And this issue arises because since we started with the database first approach, there's no way for our database and application to be in sync. Entity framework doesn't know what to do. It's just like, oh, I guess this is a brand new database that we're creating. So we're going to see that once we actually do this correctly, there's going to be a table in our database that's going to contain uh, the entity framework migrations. So that will keep our API and our database in sync so that they both know what's in the database and what's in our application models. So let's actually do this correctly. So what we're going to do is I'm going to delete this migrations folder because this is incorrect. I'm going to go back here and remove this. So this would be like the snapshot of what we have right now. So what we're going to go do is we're going to add .NET EF migrations add. So we're going to do init create. And we're going to create this migration. So this is essentially going to be just a snapshot and this is going to get the database and the API in sync. So we actually don't want to push any changes since our database already exists. So we're going to go into this init create. And so this up command is essentially the changes that you're pushing. And if you wanted to revert those changes, you would do a down command. So let's just remove all of this because we don't need it. We don't want to make actually any changes. We just want to get everybody up to date with what actually exists. So now, uh, with the speed and the only migration, we're not going to run .NET EF database update and press enter and we'll see what happens. So this command is done as it says right here. So now let's see what happened. So obviously there was nothing in here. So the database shouldn't have changed. So let's go back to our database and refresh it. And now that we refresh our tables, we see that we have this EF migrations history and inside of it is this migration ID. So now our API and our database are up to date. So our API now knows that we already have these three tables with their given columns and the database is now talking to the API. So now Entity Framework is like, okay, I know what already exists. So now if I wanna add one column and we run a new migration. So now if we do the .NET EF migrations add, add color, and we do this migration, we're gonna see that all it's gonna do is try and add in that one color column. So now that our command completed, we see that we have a new migration, add color. And all we're seeing in the up and down is that we're adding this one column. We're not adding in the whole database again because now entity framework, that entity framework table in the database is keeping all of this up to date. So now you again would just run a 
.NET EF database update and press enter. And now that this is done, let's go see if it actually created our column in here. So let us refresh this table and select and we can see that now we have this empty color column. So we would need to just put values in here, but we were able to now switch from DB first to code first and make our changes effective without needing to actually do it in here. But that's all you guys need to know on how to scaffold your application using the DB approach. And if you need to do any further changes, you can use the code first approach going forward. But if you want to learn more about the code first approach, click on this video right here.